Think back and reflect for a moment. When was the first time you realized you were black? Being black in America ain't easy. Racism existed back in the day, and it's still here. When we're harassed while barbecuing with family, arrested at Starbucks, can't even watch birds without somebody calling the police on us. We're discriminated against for our natural hair, shot while jogging, and two times more likely to be shot and killed by police. It's mentally draining. As a matter of fact, black adults in the U.S. are more likely than white adults to report persistent symptoms of stress, sadness, and a general sense of hopelessness. But addressing mental health in the clinical sense has historically been seen as a sign of weakness for some in the black community. Okay, my father is not going to cry. Black men do not get emotional. My dad was so afraid of someone seeing him cry that he had his tear ducts removed. First of all, this thing called mental health is a Western concept. Every institution in America was born from the blood of white supremacy ideology and capitalism. That is the ultimate disease. Dr. Theopia Jackson is a licensed clinical pediatric psychologist and the president of the Association of Black Psychologists. For the last 30 plus years, she's been navigating Western psychology through Afrocentric approaches. Explain to me the Association of Black Psychology. During the civil rights movement in 1968, like other organizations, they were asking the question, what does it mean to be healthy and whole from a black perspective? The common thread is starting with who we are as people of African ancestry and defining us from that place as opposed to from others. Mental health in the black community now is, is it seems to be getting a bit more of attention than it has in the past. But for quite some time, even in like in my lifetime, when I was younger, the idea of black folks going to seek help was taboo. Why is that? Mental health is limiting because these assaults are coming at us in multiple ways, even before we take our first breath. I would submit to you the way in which we engaged in, in faith-based spaces and places in our religion, that rhythmic nature was part of our healing, right? The ways in which we have our sister friend conversations are part of our healing. The ways in which our brothers line up in those barbershops and, and tell their story. So healing was always, always there. We just did not know that. We had not claimed it as such. And so black psychology has demonstrated the science of that, that that is our healing medicine, if you will, our spoken medicine. How do we bring healing to this collective trauma? We've been doing what we call the emotional emancipation circles. It's about not only grounding us in our culturalness, but bearing witness to each other's story to say that when you talk about what happened to you, I hear that, I understand that, it is real. It's time to defy the lies of black inferiority and white superiority and the truth of black humanity. So won't you join me on this journey and gently open your eyes if you haven't already done so. Welcome to the Emotional Emancipation Circle. Some black folks do seek help, especially when it comes to addressing the negative effects of racism. But some spaces are better suited than others, like an emotional emancipation circle. It's a safe space for black folks to address racial trauma. What should I expect? Uh, you know how they do colon cleansers? What that <laughs> yes, that's let's not, go there. That's not pleasant. But it's essential. Okay. The circle is like going through a cleansing, mm -hmm. a, a releasing, an engaging of parts of yourself that have been tucked away, possibly for most of your life. These circles are held all over the world in communities of color. The one today is led by Dr. Cheryl Grills, the past president of the Association of Black Psychologists and a psychology professor at Loyola Marymount University. Cameras aren't normally allowed into a session, but they agreed to let us film an introduction to one. Hello, everyone. My name is Cheryl Tawede Grills. I am a mother and a daughter uh, and a student and lover of all things African. And my people are from South Carolina by way of Congo, Nigeria, and Ghana, and Senegal. My name is Alzo Slade Jr. Albert Brady. Deanna Cook. Philip Lester. 
Um, a lot of people call me uh, Rock. My name is Zoe Stanton. I'm a student and a daughter. Brother, uncle. A leader. A cousin, a friend. And my people are from the Dirty South. Dallas, Texas. My folks, I'm on my father's side. They, um, they came from Haiti. To defy the lie today, I choose to emancipate from self-doubt. To defy the lie today, I choose to emancipate from, I would say, self-doubt um, as a black woman. Anger. Fear. Fear is a big one. Our lives for several hundred years has been driven by fear. Is this group therapy? No, because group therapy is a therapeutic process that is guided by the principles of mental health and psychotherapy. Consider this more like a self-help group. It's not about trying to prove to the Eurocentric Western psychology establishment that what we do is legitimate. We don't care if they think it's legitimate or not. We think it's legitimate. And it has been by word of mouth that this, these circles have come to such a level of demand that it, is, it sees our capacity to deliver them right now. When we did a circle in Baltimore, a brother sent out a tweet, and his tweet said essentially, I feel like I'm in an AA meeting, and I didn't even know I needed help. We have been carrying the weight of the assault nonstop mm -hmm. on us as a people in the U.S. and globally. So we respond differently, but we also are at a point where we don't have to personally experience being a George Floyd. Right. We immediately right. resonate with the pain right. that a George Floyd is going through. Couple that with the values, the African values that say you are me and I am you, you're an extension of me. What happens to you happens to me. So we end up with this incredible level of collective trauma. Mm -hmm that gets weighed on top of any personal experiences you have in, of institutional, structural, or interpersonal racism. That's a heavy burden. Think back and reflect for a moment. When was the first time you realized you were black? I know for me, I think that I uh, always knew that I was black. But I do remember, uh, I had to be like four or five, crack cocaine was prevalent in my household. Um, and somebody was ODing and the police came. And at that age, I had a affinity for the police because you see them on TV, you're like, oh yeah, police officer. And then that instance happens where the treatment is, they're pushing people and it's, it's elevated and it's attitude. And you're like, why are they treating us like that? And then once they leave you here, the older people around me saying, if we was in Beverly Hills, it wouldn't act like that. I'm like, oh, it's because we're black. I think mine was more of like in high school because I went to school in like a predominantly white area. And they always had like something to say about the way I spoke, as if it was like the way I spoke was not black enough to, for me to be black. One time I was on the phone with someone and they saw what I look like and they were like, whoa, like that doesn't match. It's also like, like what, is, what is speaking black? Yeah, it kind of. Exactly. Yeah, that's yeah. a whole nother show right and there, they, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's definitely different when it's like a black person telling you that. Sometimes the hurt, the racial pain, it's not coming from out there. Yeah. We are delivering it ourselves to each other. Yeah. And in many respects, that's even more painful. I remember like just being a class clown and you ride on the back of the bus, you know, on the back of the bus, right. that's where it goes down. That's where it goes right? down. Because you get back there getting roasted, you roasting, and it was, man, your mama so black, man, your lips so big, your nose so big. And it even got to the point to where I would tuck my lips because everybody said I had big lips, so I would tuck them. I would find a way to try to make my lips smaller. Mm -hmm. And how does it feel sharing that? Well, I, I never really thought about it, you know, and, until now. It, uh, it feels good to share it, but it also makes me angry. Good in what sense and angry in what sense? Angry in that I spent part of my life ashamed of who I was. But it feels good in the sense that, you know, it's discovery. Do you think it's possible for black folks to be their 100% selves in America? Uh, that's a hard one. James Baldwin once said, in order to be our fully whole selves, authentic, 
we have to recreate who we are as people in a space and place and time where we don't know what it looks like. I was about to say, like, can our imagination even go there? Can we exist <laughs> being disconnected from this, this white power structure? I believe we have to. Because at some point, we have to be able to provide some generation of our children a world in which they understand that they are valued, that they are lovable, intelligent, um, moral, capable of all manner of things, and that they have a gift that they've brought to the world. One of the reasons Black Panther was so popular was that it gave us that imagination for a hot second. And we are so thirsty for it. Who are you? So I, I know we have the imagination for it, but it's gonna take some work for us to actualize it in the real mundane world. We realize that the history of our people started long before the horrors of our captivity and colonization. And that key unlocks defiance. So I have to be honest, like when, when we wanted to do this story and thinking about filming even just a fraction of the circle, I did think like we might be letting white folks into Wakanda a little bit. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Is I there, love it. Is, yes. there, is, is there a concern that that opening up, opening the circle up in a in a space like this, where the public can see it, will that do you think that will affect what happens here? I think you know, the folks that will be in this circle today, it's up to them the extent to which they want to reveal themselves, to which they want to be vulnerable. But when people go there, it can end up being a very powerful experience. But now, also knowing that folks outside are going to see this, it's a sneak peek. But it's not enough of the circle to be able to go and replicate it. It's not enough of the circle to assess and analyze it. And it's not enough of the circle to co-opt it, which is actually one of my biggest concerns is that Folks will say, oh, yeah, this is, we can, we can do this. We can box this up and make this an evidence-based practice. And you can't do that because this is not that kind of party. So, yeah, you'll, you'll get a sneak peek, but... You, you ain't getting all the You juice. ain't getting all of it. You, you ain't getting all the funk. <laughs> no, no. At some point, we, we have to travel outside of the community, whether that's for school, whether that's for jobs, whether that's to, you know, just to travel for, you know, vacation to get out. And then we hit up against that reality. And, and each of us has had that. And I'm wondering if you might share an example. My mom sent me to Palisades to go um, to high school. She went there, you know. Everything was fine um, up until I think it was like, I'm pretty sure it was my senior year when an incident happened overnight where someone came and spray painted the entire front of our school with racial slurs across the street on the sidewalk, like ridiculous. Like you're like, I've been here for four years. I'm like, I've never even like, this has never happened before. Um, so that was definitely like a shock to be in like a space where you thought was so safe. And like how you said, like moving outside of, that's when um, things like this happen. I'll share something with you, Dr. Grills, that I've never, <laughs> share with anyone from Loyola Marymount. So, you know, I went to graduate school for philosophy there, and I knew on paper that I couldn't match up with the rest of the, the candidates applying because I didn't have any formal study in philosophy. So I made an appointment with the uh, director of the graduate program in philosophy. I was like, at least if I get in front of him, I can work my mouthpiece, you know, and try to, you know, <laughs> try to finesse a little bit, you know. I'm at University Hall at the philosophy department. This middle-aged white man approaches me, and the first thing he says to me, he says, oh, I'm so glad you're here. Let me show you to the janitor's closet so you can get the vacuum cleaner and get to work. Those were the first words said to me on campus. Now, in this moment, I had to do a cost-benefit analysis. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, what, what, what would be the cost? Right. If I slapped the fire out of this man, 
in the way that I want to. If I slapped the fire out of him, he would have duped me twice because he would have controlled me through my emotion, emotional reaction and I would have never gotten mm -hmm. into the school, mm -hmm. right? So I had to bottle that up. Yep. I, I just walked past him right. and had my meeting, got accepted to the program and the rest is history. But in that moment, like even right now, it gets me fired up. I see you know it, I, I can see it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you were to give words to that fired up, what is, what is the fired up? What are you feeling? Rage. That had nowhere to go. Now you let the genie out the bottle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just means you don't have to carry it no more. You know, and LMU is just a microcosm of the world. One of my first experiences in my first year as a faculty member, I'm pulling into the parking lot to park my car, to go to my office, to get ready to go teach my class. And up comes one of the faculty who's also, he was also in the Jesuit community, he's a priest. And he took it upon himself to run up to my car, tell me to roll down my window. And I'm like, is there a tail light out? Did I hit something? I don't, so I rolled down my window. He says, this parking lot is for faculty only. And I'm like, okay. He says, you, well, you mean that you can't park here? I'm like, but I'm faculty. And then he gave me this look like, you lying, you know you lying, but I don't have time to mess with you today, so I'm going to leave you alone. And he a priest. Mm-hmm. So you should have put them holy hands on that boy. <laughs> <laughs> that old mantra, so, um, you know, I'm sick and tired of being sick, sick and tired. And tired. Mm -hmm. Right, like that's the point that you reach when you're in those situations where you're like, all right, I'm tired of feeling like this. Like, let me keep it pushing. In the hood, we'll tell the young boy, poke your chest out. You know what I'm saying? Put your head up. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, and of course, now in the hillers, I tell them, you know, let him cry. Right. You know, I tell them, let them cry like, cry like a man. You know, tell the women, cry like a woman. It's okay to cry. Let those feelings out. We got these micro razor cuts, mm -hmm. right? That, look, that crying to me is like mini band aids to me, mm -hmm. right? And you find yourself, and I've done all from the streets to being at war to being a combat medic. It's like all type of trauma, right? From growing up in crack houses, but I had to learn the tools. Right, um, and somebody gave me the game. So now in my work with my rights of pastor, that's what I just, I just feel like we had, you know, I, I left one war and, and joined another one. So Zoe, what do you say to folks that may look at the emotional emancipation circle and say, man, it's just some black folks getting together and complaining about their grievances? I think I would say give it time, because I think that's kind of like how I felt in the beginning. It's definitely something that's deeper than us complaining. We were still in class when Ahmaud Aubrey came out, like that story came out. So we got to talk about it in like an EEC circle in girls' class. I think the circles made me like realize more in a sense, like your situations might seem so isolated, but like truly there are people who like you can lean on who have like experienced the same things. How did you feel about the circles today? <laughs> uh, you try to anticipate what's gonna happen, which is kind of a futile exercise. My takeaway is I need to revisit some of the work that I've done on myself that I thought was successful and I might have left some residual stains <laughs> yeah. there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah.